Hey, leaders, it's your cheerleader here. And I wanted to start this episode by giving a huge thank you to those who have been tuning in every week, subscribing to iTunes, and leaving us a review. You have no idea how helpful that is in helping other future failed it leaders find us. So I wanted to read one of the reviews we received recently from Spicy Wine. Spicy Wine writes, Fail, yeah. This podcast is a blend of honesty, humor, positivity, and useful ideas to implement quickly with impact. Leadership has never been put to the test like it has lately. This podcast is sure to help you unwind, stay inspired, and be action oriented. Looking forward to more content. Spicy wine, I don't know who you are, but I love a mold wine in the fall with a scarf adorned around my neck and some type of boot and the smell of a bonfire burning. Ah, I digress, but I so appreciate you. So leaders, if you enjoyed today's episode, I want to encourage you to go over to iTunes, rate us, and give us a review. I'll be reading reviews here, and I want to give you a big fail yeah. So Fail yeah, spicy wine. Rock on with your fermented grapes and know I see you. Now let's get to failing it. Hey there, my name is Erin Deal and I'm a half Southern, half Midwestern mama, some call this voice a nasal twang, who took $5,000 to build and scale a one of a kind experiential organization that improves the lives of corporate professionals through personal development, humanity, and humor. Along the way, I've built client relationships with some of the most notable companies in the country, all while attracting a rock star team of experts and hilarious facilitators. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, what I didn't tell you is that my resume also includes a long list of comedy shows I bombed, improv teams I didn't make, companies who told me no, and many a heartache when it came to becoming a mother. I want to show you the real deal of the grit, creativity, and determination it takes to overcome your disappointments, embrace the suck, and design the career you could only dream about. I believe we all have our own unique gifts that we bring to the world, and it is our mistakes that help to unwrap them. Welcome to Failed It. Welcome to the Failed It podcast, the podcast that reminds you you have to fail in order to improve. I'm Erin Deal, the founder of Improve It and your host, and today I am so excited to have our guest, Kyle Stapleton, Senior Manager of Culture and Experience for Warner Media Studios, the creative production engine that supports Warner Media brands like TBS, TNT, HBO Max, Cartoon Network, NBA TV, True TV, CNN, Bleaker Report, and more. So at Warner Media Studios, he fosters an environment that empowers top creative talent to shape culture through stories. So this entails working across the employee life cycle from talent attraction and onboarding through engagement, inclusion, and development. So his team's goal is to make Warner Media the world's most prominent destination for multimedia creatives. So as part of his interest in designing more soulful human work experiences, experiences, Kyle co-founded the Atlanta chapter of Culture Lab X, a global community of EX professionals experimenting with the future of work. He also advises and champions organizations working at the intersection of Atlanta's cultural impact and civil rights legacy, such as Atlanta Influences Everything, Generator, and Future Foundation. Now to add, to his already impressive resume, Kyle also co-hosts Toon Dig, a podcast about music discovery born from years of working with record stores. He earned his bachelor's and MBA from Georgia State University's Robinson College of Business, and he and his wife, Carolee, a visual artist and curator, are proud lifelong ATLans. I hope I said that right, Kyle. So just a quick background on how I know Kyle. So we met on a work trip to Atlanta with myself and our Improve It Client Experience Manager, Jenna, and we were just so impressed by his love of all things company culture and his love of ATL, and I had to have him on the show. So Kyle, welcome. We are so excited to have you here. It is an honor and a privilege, and I'll have what you're having. (laughs) I have not been able to keep up that level of energy (laughs) since I've been stuck in my house. Well, I'm coming to you live from my closet, so um, 
I'm staring at some shoes and I've got a hot tea. So maybe that's well, that's where it's coming from. Shoes and hot tea, Kyle. That's where I'm at right now. So, well, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm pumped you're here, actually. Um, so tell me, this is the Failed It podcast. And obviously, I just read a series of amazing accomplishments. You are a very accomplished man. You have a passion for what you do. It comes across in all the things that you do. But what I want to know is your failed it resume. So this could be, um, we are actually recording this right now for people listening during the uh, quarantine. So it could be a time that you failed it in the past. It could be happening right now. But give us your failed it resume. So let's hear it. I'm actually really excited to to talk about this. I don't get to talk about this kind of stuff enough. And I, I, I don't think other people do either. So one, kudos on this concept in general. I was thinking a lot about it in terms of the narrative of my life. Um, if it were like a movie, what would the scenes be that defined and moved the plot forward? And I couldn't think of a lot of like big, massive, oh my God, my life is ruined. You know, when I went, it was interesting that when I started thinking about failure, I started thinking about catastrophic failure. Mm -hmm. And there hasn't been a ton of that, but there has been a constant hum of not getting it right and uh, failing to meet my own expectations or the expectations of others. So I kind of failed to think about failure in the right way. Oh, I w- hey, that's bold statement. I appreciate that. <laughs> there have been a lot of things over the course of, you know, I've been in the working world for close to 15 years now. And the, the first thing that I thought about was uh, failing to be born at the right time because I graduated from college into the teeth of what at the time was the, the greatest recession of my lifetime and mm. now looks like it might be rivaled. Mm-hmm. It was very cool to be in my 30s and living through my second global meltdown. So that was really interesting. And I kind of failed to be prepared for a moment like that. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I knew I wanted to be somewhere at the intersection of, of creativity and commerce. You know, I wanted to be an artist of some kind, but not be poor. And that kind of vagueness of direction in a world that kind of expects the opposite, um, did not suit me well to be resilient in that moment. So I pivoted what little plan I had into going back to school. Um, and, and, I started in a liberal arts graduate program because I was like, well, if the private sector can melt down at any time, then I I need to steer clear of a soul sucking like sales job or or whatever. So I I was getting a master's in communications and then realized I was basically on track to be a professor. And that was kind of it. And uh, so I aborted that mission uh, the semester I started writing my thesis on the advisement of a mentor named Edward Benpong, who was like, dude, just get back on track, you know, do something pragmatic, put your skills to use in the right way. He encouraged me to get an MBA, wrote a letter of recommendation. And so I, I went back in that direction and I was 24 at the time, I think, and got my tail handed to me the whole time I was in that program. I was one of the youngest people in the program, didn't have enough like translatable work experience for it to be totally valuable. So if I had that to do over again, I probably wouldn't have started an endeavor like that until much later. Um, I think if I were going through it now, it'd be more valuable. But um, I learned a lot about reading the room and learning from other people's mistakes and just like shutting up if you don't have anything to say and mm-hmm. just, just trying to absorb as much as possible. And so I learned probably more on the meta layer than I did in the actual classroom experience. And that's saying something because I I learned a lot in that program about the way work works. And it, it, you know, arguably was the thing that set me down this path of thinking about how work works and why work sucks for a lot of people. And why does it have to suck? What if it didn't? And like what if we just fundamentally rethought what we value in society because work is at the center of our lives. Mm. So that was a, that was a big thing that lasted 
for the the better part of my 20s thinking about what the hell I was going to do with my life through sort of the lens of an activist. And every job I've had since then has been has been a string of like failures through boundary pushing. I haven't really quite ever totally fit in the nine to five world. And, and only with this current job have I really started to feel like I've found my tribe and these people appreciate the questioning nature that that I bring to things and are also very on board with like things don't have to be the way they are currently. I mean, I work at a company started by Ted Turner, like one of the great mm-hmm. all time great American Mavericks, right? Who who questioned the entire ecosystem of how people consume media and uh, gather around things that they're passionate about. I hear a plane. I hear a plane too. That's that's where we're at right now in quarantine and things can happen. You may hear a baby crying in a moment. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely have failed to soundproof this for, for podcasting. Hey, but you're nailing the failed it podcast. <laughs> that's right. Okay, that's right. Coming to you real and raw. That's it. So the first job that I had out of grad school was um, at a communications and creative agency. Um, and I was like, this is the best job that I'm ever going to have. I get to like write and work on design and be creative. And I loved and still love the people that I worked with and found that I didn't love the agency environment or model. I got a lot of opportunities, but I also pushed a lot of the wrong buttons by shooting for even more opportunities. It's a weird way to start your career because you get access Mm -hmm. to all these brands and um, all of these different projects. And it makes you think, like I can do anything. Um, And I did get to do a lot of stuff because I had great faith placed in me by great leaders. Um, But, you know, I I missed the mark on things as much as I got it right. Mm. And I learned, one, that my my biggest failure as an individual professional was in follow through and finishing the drill. And so I had great people that recognized that early that were like, you need project manager types around you. You need operationalizers. You need people that are going to keep your train on the tracks. Um, so I, I failed then and I, I continue to fail. It's always going to be a work in progress. Like I know this is my lifelong professional thing, knowing that um, if, if I do it alone, if I try to do too much of it myself, I inevitably will fail, especially with the kinds of like big, complex, often abstract, usually long-term um, ambitious things that I like to work on, they always take a village. And sure. putting not only people around me, but the right kinds of people around me and a mix of people, a diversity of people uh, is, is so, so important to my ability to succeed at all. And that's come from time after time of sometimes outright failing, but a lot of times like getting a B when I wanted an A on a project, mm-hmm. you know, not mm-hmm. quite getting it to where I wanted it to be. Um, and that's been an ongoing thing that I learned early and it's the most consistent piece of feedback that I ever get in the working world. Interesting. I want to stop you right there. So that, first of all, I worked in an agency as one of my very first corporate jobs and I agree. It's a very weird way to start off, right? Cause you're right. You see all these brands, you see all these things, um, it's a very different environment than I think working for a brand. But what I heard you say is beyond that is something really interesting. So it seems to me like you're an innovator and you need to surround yourself with integrators, right? Like you come up with these ideas, you ha- you push the envelope, you step outside the box, but you need the people around you, the project manager types to help implement those ideas and move things forward. Is that right? Have That's you ever right. heard of the book? Rocket Fuel. Have you ever heard of that book before? I have not. Who's it by? It, I, I will have to put, I'm going to put it in the show notes. I can't think of who the author is right now, but I will tell you what you just said is so incredible to realize because as soon as you realize that, I think pe- the world needs both. They need the innovators and that's where a lot of C-level people sit. That's where a lot of 
entrepreneurs come from is this innovative world. You see things big picture, you come up with the ideas, but you need those integrators to help make those projects come to life. So the fact that you realize that earlier in your career and have used that, so what could have been a failure, you've actually flipped it and have made it part of your success, I think is super cool. Still TBD, right? I mean, still got to show up yeah, and yeah. put in the reps. I love that term, innovators and integrators. Um, being around entrepreneurs and in that world for a long time, I've always heard the phrase starters and scalers, Yeah, right? You're like you're the person to, to bring the thing to life from out of thin air or recognize the gap and, and flesh it out. But then the scalers are like really a lot of times the unsung heroes, right? Like the people that, that do it, they're in the trenches every day, they make it happen. I'll never be one of those people. And I think it was a great lesson to just kind of draw that line in the sand pretty early in my career and just be like, it's okay that I'm not this person and I'll never be this person. And it's probably not a good use of my time or resources to invest in training to be this person. Like I should be able to talk this talk. I should be able to work well with the kinds of people that are naturally good at this. But that's not my contribution to a team effort. That's not my gift. And I don't need to belabor the fact that it probably will never be. Totally. And I think that's, I mean, the fact that you recognize it, why play to, like, that's not necessarily your strength. You're playing to your strengths and the world needs the innovators. So I think that it's wonderful what you've done. I do want to ask you this. So Given the current situation right now, we're in the middle of a quarantine. We are, this will probably come out as we are still coming out of this quarantine. But how have you in your current role, how have you adjusted and pivoted using that innovator mindset with what is now considered to be our quote unquote, you can't see my hands, Kyle, but quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, new normal. How have you adjusted and how have you pivoted yourself, your team? And even with this, I, I think I would think you being an innovator, you have probably come up with a lot of ideas. I just want to know how that's been for you. It's a great question. Being in the media business where we've been in quicksand collectively as an industry for a decade, right? Since tech came along and disrupted everything and production has been democratized and all tech companies or media companies now and vice versa. Um, we've gotten pretty used to the conditions of change being the only constant, right? This is obviously at an entirely new level. And the fact that it affects everyone in the world, um, not just us, and it extends to things that we had previously taken for granted, like that's its own thing. But in a lot of ways, we were as ready for this thing as any organization could be. We were looking in a lot of ways to virtualize our workflows so that editors could work from wherever they were. And um, we were thinking about things in terms of like, okay, we're going to be launching HBO Max very soon. The way we deliver content, the audience for the content, uh, the business metrics, right? Moving from cable revenues to subscription model primarily as our vehicle for revenue. Everything top to bottom about our business is changing. And so the creative part of our organization is changing in lockstep with that. And we got to be able to find talent from anywhere, right? Not just New York, LA, Chicago, wherever. Um, the next generation of this business is going to look totally different than the previous generation did, which, you know, the foundations of, of Turner as a company, as part of Warner Media, did that same thing a generation ago. So it's like, it's in our DNA, right? We basically... If anything, just accelerated the things that we were doing that we were looking at, uh, virtual post-production infrastructure, stuff like that. Even live production, we have managed to do a fair amount of that from people's homes, doing switcher and integration and live graphic playback, and obviously not to the level of production value that we're used to. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to define a new normal. And the thing everybody is really excited about the consistent conversation that everyone's having is um, we don't want to go back to normal. Mm. This has broken us of a lot of bad habits that we built up over the years or just things we've taken for granted or expectations that we've always done it this way and things that we always muttered under our breaths. Like, you know, 
if I could change this, if I could wave a magic wand and make this go away and break everybody in this habit, I would. And now we're all saying, okay, this is a once in a century opportunity, like set aside the terrible human cost of what got us here. Yeah. And all the failings associated with that, like just in the context of the work that we're doing, we will never get an opportunity like this to pause, stop down, reflect, and rethink everything, top to bottom, large and small, that we've done on our teams, on our productions, on our organizations. So the mood around that is actually really excited. And the way that's come to fruition for us as employee experience people is changing the way we do meetings, the way we communicate, our norms around that, uh, moving a lot of that more virtually. And in addition to just the standard like video conferencing experiments that you're seeing all over people's LinkedIn's, um, collaboration tools around sharing media and assets and communicating on Slack and how we change our workflows, how we move huge pieces of media around. Um, we're really excited about breaking down old habits and, and seeing how that's changing. And so helping people um, stay connected, making sure that the most up-to-date messages and, and knowledge um, are centralized and shared, communicating on a really, really kind of aggressive basis um, has been a key part of what we're doing. And then just documenting everything people are saying, where trends are popping up, uh, what we're learning, what's going well, what isn't. Just constant, like, all right, let's put this in cold storage as we figure out, like, what's our return plan? What's the rest of the year look like? What's next year look like? Even taking a lot of feedback and creating a, a really accelerated feedback loop to, to just, like, be smarter and work different. Oh, my God. Kyle, this... I just got chills when you said this. I'm not going to lie to you. This is very cool to hear, especially from just an organization like Turner Media. I think I hear you on all of that. Like this time for pause and reflection is so crucial. And I will say this for myself as an entrepreneur and a business owner. I just said this yesterday. I have not taken a pause in six years. And that's where this business started. So the fact that, you know, from very small business to top, top companies all over the, the world are taking this moment to pause, reflect, and look at how things are done. I do think our new, our new normal is exciting. I, again, as you mentioned, the way that we got here was not, and it was very hard, and it is still hard. We're still fighting through it. But I do think that it's so interesting to think about when you said tools like Slack and the song, like I'm a huge nerd when it comes to just let's make processes as succinct and beautiful as possible. So the fact that you guys are doing that and going back and, cre you know, re looking at how things are done, I, you're absolutely right. At what point do we pause to do this otherwise? So that is so cool. And thank you. This nerd just got real excited about some <laughs> software systems. Okay. Hey friends, I wanted to pause really quick and tell you about something we have coming up at Improve It. Now it's called Improve It's WFH Workshop From Home Membership. We hope you can join us. So as a member, we have an awesome arrangement of things that will help you navigate this remote environment and improve yourself both personally and professionally. So as a WFH member, you will receive one live interactive virtual workshop with your fellow community members to help you navigate remote work, an automatic ticket to our weekly live virtual webinars, or a recording to watch it whenever works best for you, a three-week DIY that's do-it-yourself e-learning course that's built in conjunction with the monthly workshop, and an online community, including a private Facebook group where you will receive live weekly mini coaching sessions with yours truly, laugh and lunch events with our hilarious improv professionals, and an exclusive weekly weekly newsletter to members that gives you all the weekly deets. So we're offering all of this for the low price of $19.99. Let me say it again for the people in the back, $19.99. So a portion of every purchase will be donated to our charity partners, Girl Forward and Girls Rock Charlotte to support their programs during this challenging time. The last date to sign up for our June cohort is May 31st at 11.59 p.m. So you'll find the link to sign up in our show notes. We can't wait to laugh and learn with you. I'll see you there.
Okay. So I want to think about this too, and and we've kind of jumped away from your failure resume, but I want to go back to it a minute. And we use something here at Improve It during our workshops. It's the chicken hat, and it's been just like a mascot that we use, right? And we use it for a couple reasons. We use it, number one, to break down barriers. So, But whenever you hear the word improv, whoever's holding the chicken hat in the workshop will pass it to the person on their right. We do a chicken dance in our workshops. It's a real thing. So we use this as sort of our mascot in all things, and it's basically... The, the meaning behind it is get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So what is your chicken hat or your chicken champion moment? What would you say throughout the series of failures that you mentioned previously? And even maybe what, you, you know, the failures you had to go through to even talk about what, you know, you're doing now with this pivot. What would you say was the most important lesson you learned by just leaning into this and becoming a little bit more comfortable with the uncomfortable? It's a really cool question. And I want to get an Atlanta version of a, a chicken hat, but have it just be a chicken wing because that's the official mascot oh, of the city. That's right. That's right. Okay. We'll make it happen. The lemon pepper chicken hat. You know, it's interesting. I I think I've learned a couple of things um, uh, over the years. I think a lot about the, the fortune favors the bold idea, mm. right? And just the, the value of just speaking up, um, being a precocious early 20 something year old at the agency and um, raising my hand or, or bordering on making demands when that probably wasn't warranted or welcomed. Um, but it, it was received with warmth and open arms. Mm -hmm. Um, it really emboldens you, right? When you put stuff out to the universe and it's received and reciprocated, you want to do more of it. It's it's virtuous in that way. So that's a risk. And, um, I think we're in a place where, when we're trying to establish new norms and do things differently than we've done before, we got to see, we got to recognize and be aware of what that feels like in, in the individual situational moment, you know, like you, you got to get through the discomfort of this doesn't look like something I previously have experienced and I'm comfortable with. Um, but it's going to push us ultimately, hopefully into something better. Right. So Mm -hmm. just being aware when you're working in your teams of, um, and, and I've, Pick this up now that I've been managing people for for a couple of years now. Being open to receiving whatever their idea is and, and treating it like a like kind of a precious thing. What uh, what can we do with this? Like receiving it in a spirit of openness and an additive. Like you'll appreciate that we use yes and pretty constantly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in our team environments. Right? It's never no. Like we really work actively not to shut enthusiastic ideas down, but to say. I hear you. I love the spirit of that. What if this and this instead? Uh. So I know that takes discomfort. And I think being a person thinking about what it, what it feels like to show up at work every day. And that's how culture is created. Like the, the shared meaning that people experience as the kind of collection of their individual experiences. Um, we want people to feel like it's a place where they can do that, where they can put themselves out there, their whole selves, their, unapologetically weird selves, their most radical stuff, and they're going to be accepted and appreciated for it. Cause that's the only way, like their individual contribution and value is the only way we're going to get better and be different and reach more people with the stories that we tell. So that's super, super important. And it's hard to do in practice. It's just like, you know, you can't just be married. You got to like show up and decide to invest in that, that kind of relationship as well. The longer I'm married, the more I think about like just being open to and receiving the people around you is the like one important, very small step you can take. And I learned that from like never being uncomfortable enough uh, with asking the uncomfortable things or doing the prodding and realizing that that was kind of unusual (laughs) because people told me it was. And so realizing that it's not as easy for other people, I want to be a person that gives that back tenfold like make Mm. them more comfortable with it because we'll all be better when we hear from the people with all these great, beautiful ideas that they're not necessarily comfortable sharing all the time. Kyle, 
Oh my God. We're going to, this will just make a huge clip on everything we do as a, as a yes and testimony. Okay. So first of all, well, it's rule number one. It's rule number one. Yes. And then I love that you said speak up. I think that that, you know, our audience is a lot of people who are maybe early in their career, mid-level in their career, even even at the senior level around where you are and even beyond that. But no matter what stage you're at, I think how you get ahead is by speaking up and becoming uncomfortable with the uncomfortable and then making it that safe space that you just mentioned for everybody's ideas to be heard. I was just sitting back here nodding and going, "Mm -hmm, yes, and and then you said it and I was like, praise. Um, So that is beautiful. And you know what? I can tell you this from the moment that Jenna and I met you and then just, you know, taking the small tour that we got of Turner with you, um, you could feel that like the culture, the energy, the vibe of what you guys do seems very inclusive. You want to have these, these, you know, points in your, um, I should, lack of a better word, journey through Turner, where people can collaborate and connect, you can feel that culture there and you can feel it in how you operate. And so that's super cool. Um, And the fact that you realized that early on, I think has gotten you, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we know each other kind of, but I'm just saying, I think it's gotten you to this point because being inquisitive, asking those difficult questions is very hard for a lot of people. And so if you're seeing that and encouraging other people to ask those ideas or to speak up in meetings and ask questions and, you know, be curious, I think that's where people start to feel more valued. And we all know what that happens when that happens. Productivity rises and we all thrive. So very cool answer. Thank you for that. I love that. <laughs> so Speaking around this improv term, in improv, we say there are no mistakes, there are only gifts, right? So what would you say are your three action items for others to improve themselves based on learning from your quote unquote gifts, or we'll call them your mistakes or failures? So what would you say you would tell people three things they could do based on what you've learned? You're asking really cool questions. This has been a fun interview. Thank you. Thank you. The first one is to, to rebel, Yeah. to rebel against the, the tyranny of the everyday. I was raised by both my parents are the best parents in the history of parenting. I'm like truly the, <laughs> the Jordan and Pippin of parents, but my mom in particular is a, is a rebel um, and speaks up for what she believes in. And, and so that behavior was role modeled for me my whole life. And, the thing that she always believed in the most was championing the underdog, you know, taking care of the person that couldn't take care of themselves and looking out for other people before herself. And so that's a, that's a lethal combination when you put those two things Mm -hmm. together. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm. I want to meet your mom next interview, your mother. You got it. Okay. Okay. You got it. And the, the craziest thing about my mom is that she would tell you that, you know, she doesn't have anything to say, like, you know, I, I'm not a person worth interviewing, whatever. Would I know that would be her first response. And she's a, an absolutely incredible person um, and, and has given so much to so many. Um, but th- the sort of counterpart of that is the ability to see the beauty in everything by just being aware. And it, a lot of my childhood that was framed as kind of a rebellion. Like most people spend their whole lives not appreciating that stuff enough. Mm, mm-hmm. And what a, what a sad way to live, to be asleep. You got to rebel and you got to be awake. You've been given this gift and you have to, you have to show up and you got to water it every single day. Right. So it is a little bit of a rebellion to be like, you know what? I am not going to take this like, consumerist complacent life on the chin. I'm going to do it my way. And that that's like the main, I learned that attitude and that posture from my mom of like, Mm. the best thing that I can do at the end of this life is to know that it was mine and mine only. And it starts with a worldview of like, here are the things that I find beautiful that I want to celebrate, that I want to spend my time with, that I want to grow. And I want to keep as much of that other bull outside my door as possible. So rebel is the first thing. 
I think the second thing is to, this is probably two and three. Uh, the important thing is to like, to make it mean something. And, and to me, the only way to make it really mean something is to use those gifts for others. Mm. And that should always be the orientation first. And as much as that was ingrained in our household growing up, you know, growing up in the home of the American civil rights movement, um, where like America's number one hero and kind of moral compass and, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, his, his birthplace is on my work commute on Auburn Avenue. Mm. And I pass Ebenezer Baptist Church and his childhood birth home every single day. And it dawned on me at some point that I had been taking for granted that I was passing that. Um, and it was like, never, ever, ever again. I want to think about that every single day when I pass the Ebenezer Baptist Church sign. So, you know, Dr. King actually became pretty radical at the end of his life and had this idea of the beloved community of people living together um, in peace and harmony in full acknowledgement of the things that made them different, right? And overcoming the forces that made people more the same or made people compete with one another um, or made life a zero-sum game. I have become a huge advocate for extending that legacy. I feel like it's my responsibility as an ATLian to, to do that um, as a citizen at ground zero of, of the movement that shook the whole world. And I don't know that there's really any other way to conduct yourself. Like I, I just don't think any of this work that we're doing around making ourselves better or creating culture and, and fun moments as a collective, like we, we, everything we do anyway ties into other people. So it's like, why not make it better? Why not make it mean something? Um, we'll never be as good as we can possibly be as a society until we take care of everyone up and down the spectrum. And, you know, it's been cool to see the workforce conversation start to shift toward issues of equity and issues of diversity and inclusion and who gets to show up where and, uh, how we gave some people a head start in this country for 200 years. And um, we really got to expand and reframe how we think about how we got here and where we go from here. And I think when I say make it mean something, uh, think about your gifts and how to apply them. Make it mean something means like that you should radicalize yourself. Like you, you should push farther, faster for more progress, especially now, especially in light of what's happened in the past six, eight weeks. Again, we have an opportunity to get as close to wiping the slate clean as we possibly could ever get. And we have all the tools and the technology and the resources. We just need to be, we need to be moving, right, in, in this void to push into the place that we know we can be. When people ask about creativity, I had the session that I do on um, generating ideas on demand as you an individual person, right? Because we got to do, we got to generate more ideas and create more content. Uh, with the same or fewer resources than we've ever had. And in that session, like defining creativity is kind of the baseline and it's seeing the world not as it is, but as it could be. Like, that's the gift of creativity. And everybody has that in them, right? Everybody mm -hmm. thinks about how something could be better. And whether it's a home improvement project or a thing at work or their community or the way they raise their kids or whatever, that is a creativity, right? So just the the seeing things better in some way, making that mean something and making it impact the lives of others positively is the greatest gift that we can give each other. Mm. Kyle, I am giving you snaps. It was like going <laughs> to church. Okay. I was like, yes, I was doing some head nods. I, yes. So number one, be a rebel. No, and within that, be aware. I love that. Number two, it's, Make sure that you are serving. That's what I took from that is have a service mindset. And I love it. Almost it was like number three was like, we have this opportunity to wipe the slate clean. Let's get after it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's get after it. I like that. Let's get after it. That's your number three. Let's get after it. So preach. I loved that. Thank you. I wish the world had that mentality because that was beautiful and eloquently spoken. And I think you have the right job, my friend. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. 
I don't expect everybody to be where I'm at on that stuff. Like this is the stuff that keeps me up at night. But I think if people can move 10% more in that direction, right? Just like do totally do one of those things a little bit, just move forward from where you are, then we're all going to be a little better on the other side of this. Yes. Okay. Don't, don't, let the, don't let the size or the complexity of the problems keep you from doing something. Right. Move the needle a tiny bit, just a tiny bit, and you have moved mountains, right? right. So, oh my God, that was wonderful. Thank you for that. Okay. So really quick, what did you fail at today? <laughs> uh, I showered, <laughs> so I did that. You're winning. Yeah. I set an intention for myself when I go to bed every night, like kind of visualizing my next day. And ever since I've been at home, being a super extroverted person, I realized that I'm like physically not able to draw the same level of energy. Like I can't operate at the same battery percentage I normally do. So I'm never waking up as early as I want to, including today. I'm probably humming it consistently 15 ish, 20 ish percent below what I know I'm capable of. Um, and today's an example. Like, th- this is for sure the highlight of my day. I'm really excited about getting to do this. But I, I would like to get to a place knowing that this is going to last a while longer where my own day, my personal space, my headspace, my energy level, especially, feels a little more normal. Until then, I'm, I'm waking up starting every day with a fail. No. Well, guess what? You're waking up, so you're winning. Okay. Think yeah, of it that no, way. That should be a bumper sticker. You know? Yeah. Write that down. All right. Well, that's it's fun to think about that, right? Because, you know, we always think about our successes, but with every failure, you learn. So you just learned, hey, I'm going to try to get up a little bit earlier tomorrow. Maybe I'll get some coffee and do some reflections or maybe a, a yoga pose. Tough to tell. You've got the day is yours, Kyle. That's right. You know, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So this is our final, my final question, and it comes in the form of of a lightning round. Now, you didn't know this was coming, okay? I love a good surprise. Here it is. This is a little improv and a little thinking quickly on your feet, right? So this is what I call the fail yeah round, okay? So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to just respond as fast as you can with only one word answers, okay? Deal. So no, you can't fail, but if you say more than one word, I'm going to say fail yeah and then it's just you failed but but you can't really fail remember that okay so are you ready kyle for fail yeah yes okay here it comes remember one word only okay one word to describe your early career adventurous nice one word to describe where you're currently at in your career fulfilling nice one word to describe your future self activist One word to describe your favorite boss. Caring. One word to describe your least favorite boss. Idiot. (laughs) (laughs) That got me. Okay. One word to describe your management style. Empowering? Okay. Mm -hmm. One word to describe Atlanta. Culture. And one word to describe this interview. Energizing. Yes. Oh my God. You nailed it. You nailed it. You didn't fail it. Okay. That was amazing. I'm going to give you a round of applause. Golf claps all around. Golf claps. Yes. Yes. Okay, Kyle. So how can anyone listening find you on any social media platform? How do we find you? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, Generally, my username on social is KSTAPS, K-S-T-A-P-S. Just one of those high school bro nicknames that never went away. (laughs) I'm on Twitter as Kyle P. Stapleton uh, because k was taken by a bot. Uh, but I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, I think, are the places. Awesome. And we'll tag those in the show notes for anybody who wants to follow Kyle. He's awesome. So thanks, everyone, so much for listening. I want you, if you enjoyed today's show, to take a screenshot of you listening to this episode. Tag us on Instagram at learn to improve it or improve it on Facebook and use the hashtag failed it podcast. That's failed it podcast. Kyle, thank you so much for being here. You rock. You failed it and you nailed it. I appreciate that. You nailed it. This was great. I, I oh. really thank you again so much. All right. See you soon, bud. See you in the A. See you in the A. 
Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to Failed It. I'm so happy you're along for the ride. And if you enjoyed today's show, head on over to iTunes to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every Wednesday. I'll see you next week, but want to leave you with this thought. What will you fail at today and how will that help your future successful self? Think about it. I'm proud of you and you are totally failing it. See you next time.